Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday. Hope everyone's weeks are going well so far. So today what we're going to do, and this is kind of by popular request um, based on the anonymous, like, I don't know if you guys saw, I sent out like that anonymous feedback survey. So some of the things people uh, said would be beneficial to the class and to kind of helping your understanding of what we've covered so far is diving a little bit deeper into some of the graphics techniques we've talked about. Um, instead of just kind of glossing over the top of things and saying, you know, this is like what ray tracing is, but we're not going to talk about how it's done or anything like that. I do want to caveat what I'm about to go through with saying that if you really want to learn more about like the foundational concepts behind the algorithms, uh, frameworks, and everything, and kind of techniques we've been talking about so far, I really recommend you take 460 and 461 because we don't have the time to do that fully, and I'm kind of just going to pick and sample little things that we can talk about today. Um, but yeah, so that's the first little caveat. So on the docket, um, I hope everyone is enjoying this like first project so far. From what it sounds like from the people I've talked to, things are going well. I'm glad to hear it. People have some procedural terrain in place. Um, if you don't, please, please, please come to our office hours. <clears throat> we will sit down with you, like go through all of the code that you have or have not written and kind of talk through the process like that. Always happy to help. Um, if you haven't taken a graphics class at Penn before, uh, I don't know, you probably haven't seen what like our graphics labs office hours are like, but it's kind of different than your normal computer science class, like 120, 121, 3, well, all of those. It's very much like sit down with someone and that person will debug and step through your code with you and it's not just like, here's what it possibly is, go figure it out. It's very intensive one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so little props and saying, you know, please take advantage of that. Um, so one of the key concepts in this first project is Perl and noise. Um, or some kind of noise function. So what I want to do today is, without really looking at the actual source code, I'm going to give a little bit of background on what Perlin noise is and then how the concepts behind Perlin noise work and at the same time generalize to other uh, noise functions. For the second half of the class, we have a pretty cool like demo and interactive session plan for today. So what Trung is going to do is he will show you some basic VR concepts that he has coded in 3.js, and you will use that as example code to kind of put what Trung has done to work. I'm not going to give away what he's done yet because it's really cool. But you're going to basically build upon what he's done in teams of two or three um, for the second 45 minutes or hour of the class. So yeah, just look forward to that. Before I get started, does anyone have any logistic questions, like any problems with the homework, um, anything you want to discuss before I dive right into noise? No? All right, so without further ado, uh, noise is basically uh, a tool that's used in graphical applications to provide a perceived sense of randomness uh, to either images or interactive models or, or the level that a player or a user is walking through so that that person, whoever it is, doesn't feel like they're doing the same thing over and over again with raw repetition. So as you can see on these two images I have on the screen, the image on the left is a purely procedural Terrain, this is, I believe, Minecraft. Is, am I right in thinking that this is Minecraft? There are cubes everywhere. Um, you can imagine what was done there was two things. So the first of which was saying, if we want to procedurally generate some kind of height, that's a great first step. So maybe we have, like, for each x, y coordinate on that, like, plane that is the floor there, we have some value for saying, okay, this thing is 8 units tall, and then maybe we just stack eight cubes on each other to make that. But what's also different here is that this terrain is also color-coded based on the height that it reaches. So if it's really low, it's water. If it's a little higher, it's sand, grass. Eventually, I think you get some snow up there on the mountains, and so on. So it's important to note that not only can this, these noise functions control the height or maybe one dimension of, of the properties of an object, but you can also use that same noise function in parallel to modify related or corresponding values. So height and appearance, or material, or texture, whatever you want to call it, are two very, very frequently tied things. The image on the right, um, this is a screenshot out of Unreal Editor, which will be actually starting on Thursday, so look forward to that. Um, that basically uh, takes in three noise samples and computes a programmatic and procedural material out of those samples. Um, this kind of node-based editor I, I've hinted to before that you see on the right 
is how you guys will be writing the large majority of your code in Unreal, which is cool. Um, if you've never worked with a node-based programming language, it's really awesome. We'll talk a lot more about that in the coming weeks. So, um, as I said, you're either burying height or you're making procedural materials. Those are two examples. So, most this is again, my slides are a little bit repetitive here, but what I want to show a difference between these two images is that the image on the left, um, this could be best described as, well, I actually want to ask you guys, if I just showed you that image on the left and said, like, what do you see, what would you say? Smoke. Perfect. Anyone else? There, there, you can see a couple of things in here. I don't know if the, this is a reach question, but does anyone, like, would anyone perceive anything other than smoke there? No? Okay. So let me throw you a little bit of a curveball. What if that was like an x-ray image and those white and black values were varying depth, right? There's, but what, my, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that those, that is one dimension of color. It's literally a grayscale color that goes from 0 to 255 to represent either black or white that's being varied over an area but could be applied to very many different things. It could be a smoke material that uses a particle effect or some kind of feature in your game. It could also be used to deform a plane to make like the darker points lower elevation, the lighter points higher elevation, and so on. Um, and kind of going off of that, that image could also be fed into a programmatic material like we saw on this slide and say, okay, not only is, are those like cloud looking things gonna be used to generate color, but it's also gonna be used to add variances in height to the material. So to talk about the concept of displacement mass that we discussed earlier in the course where you can add kind of a fake sense of height to a material. So yeah, that's a little bit of background on noise um, and what it can be used for. The type of noise we're going to be talking about today and that is most frequently attributed as the original one is Perlin noise invented by this super awesome dude named Ken Perlin who is a professor and researcher at NYU. If you ever take or if you have friends at NYU who are in computer science or some kind of engineering, he teaches an intro to computer graphics class, and if you could take intro to computer graphics from Ken Perlin, you would be really silly not to, so like, that's awesome. Um, he won an Academy Award, I think it was 1983, that was for technical achievement for the usage of Perlin noise in animated feature films. Uh, so he's pretty cool, because like for almost 25 years, he's literally been coasting on an Academy Award and can just do whatever he wants. Um, that's awesome. So Perlin noise v1 was the 1983, maybe 87, version of the noise function. That is so, 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 so old and no longer used. He introduced a new version of it in 2002 in a SIGGRAPH paper that is what we're going to be talking about today. It leverages a lot of the abilities of new processing and new processor architectures and better language functions. So improved Perlin noise is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and yeah, so this link is basically a really good example of what Perlin noise is. I will send this to you guys in Slack so you can all see it, but what we're going to go through today in class is kind of top to bottom from the pseudocode or logic perspective what Perlin noise is. So before I kind of go through these points one by one, I just want to discuss what the expected input and outputs of a noise function are and why it's useful. So uh, generally, you give in an n-dimensional vector that describes a point in space um, or in whatever dimension you're talking about. If it's 2D, it's a point on a plane. If it's 3D, it's a point in you know, 3D space, so on. And what you expect to get back out is an, a value that describes either one dimension or n dimensions of the noise at that point. So what we're mainly going to be focusing on in this class is two-dimensional input size, so saying give an xy coordinate, give me one floating point or integer value back that describes the noise at that location. So to that end, the noise algorithm can be broken down into these steps. The first of which is to take an n-dimensional vector of those floats. Now you'll notice that I did say that those are floats, they're not integers. This is going to be a little bit subtle but very important later in what we're going to be talking about in the algorithm, but basically what you want to describe is instead of giving an absolute point in space, so instead of saying, I'm looking at like, I guess this is best visualized by example. If I'm looking at a coordinate that has the absolute values of like, on a Cartesian plane, say this is five, five, that's your normal like XY coordinate system. 
But say my entire plane of reference that I'm looking for noise on is 10 by 10. It's important that you consider the input to your noise function of this point to be half and half instead of the true integer values that describe it. We'll talk about why that's important later, but you need some way to reference these coordinates on a continuous system that is described by the size of your input. So you always do them as fractions of whatever the input size that you're actually referring to is. Next, we're going to segment those floats into corresponding unit squares, cubes, or whatever, depending on the dimension that you're talking about. Third, I, again, I'm going to go through this in detail in a bit, but I want to step through it on a high level first. Third thing would be, so for each vector of the input, or for each corner of the unit squares or whatever you're, you're talking about, you need some kind of random seed. So that random seed that you generate beforehand is kind of the integration of randomness into this algorithm. We're going to talk about how that randomness, randomness gets generalized in a second, but you need some kind of random seed. That usually is a floating point value between 0 and 1, but you can also just take... Um, all permutations of like the unit vectors that describe whatever your input coordinate system is. So if it was like a 2D system, you could take 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 as your four source vectors, but I recommend you do the true random way. Um, third, uh, the next step is to get the floating point distance from the original input ve vertex or vector, I guess it is better described, to this, um, to like the unit square thing that you just made. Again, this is super abstract and it's going to go way over everyone's head for a second, but we're going to dive into it in a bit. Then you're going to take the dot product of the distance vector with the pre-computed gradients, so the random things we talked about earlier. Finally, you're going to do a LERP, so linear, linearly interpolate between those four corners, and then in 2D it's four corners, and then optionally you can um, curve it at the end. So that should have just like blown everyone away and been like, what the hell did I just say? That makes no sense. Obviously, that's not the entire thing that we're going to go through. So on a step-by-step -step basis, uh, can I describe this one? But you basically need to, first step is to describe your input space, same way you describe a basis for a space in linear algebra. Second step, so segment the floats into units, squares, or quadrants, or cubes, or whatever your source coordinate system is. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. So uh, if you remember earlier in the course, I talked about the difference between continuous and discrete numerical systems. So... The difference there is that in a continuous system, there's infinitely many segments of one area or line, and in a discrete system, like integers, it's 0, 1, 2, whatever. Flo Essentially, like you can make as many decimal values as you want between 0 and 1, but there's only 0 and 1 if you're talking about integers. So in the case that you have, hmm, what's a good example here? Say you wanted, say your input value was 0.3 repeating, so 1 third, and 0.3 repeating. If I had a Perlin noise pre-generated random gradient vector space, that was a big long sentence, my god, of a 5 by 5 grid. So say say your Perlin noise was based on a 2D array of 5 by 5 pre-computed random, just like you literally do math out random for every index in the array. You would only have a total of 25 like one, two, well, this is, okay, so assume one, two, three, four, five. This is like six long, so I'm gonna slowly get rid of this. And excuse my poor drawing ability. Did I just do this wrong? That was five, right? Am I just being blind here? Yeah. 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 On the fly demos don't always tend to go as well as you expect them to. So assume I have five pre-generated coordinates of this randomness. I need some way to correlate this 0.3 bar and 0.3 bar to the closest one. So what we're talking about, that's kind of the way of saying, which one of these unit squares does this 0.3, 0.3 fit into? So obviously in a 2D array, you would start at the top left corner because like you go out and then you go down. Normal computer science 2D array syntax. But for the sake of this demo, assume that the origin is down here. My 0.3 and 0.3, you would just take a third so you'd be somewhere uh, like right here, and then somewhere probably right here, and you'd end up right there. So I, I apologize for the five and six segment thing, but does everyone understand how 0.3 and 0.3, referring to the total size of this space, would be like that point? Yeah? Is 
that is that part clear? Okay. So that's what it mean, That's what I mean when I say you find the nearest unit square. And then what you have to think about is that each one of these like crosses is essentially a value in your 2D array that you've pre-computed of random vectors. So there's some like random <coughs> pointing vectors at each corner. So you have those four vectors are the four vectors that correspond to that point. And so the next thing you do is obviously you pre-compute those. We kind of merge those two steps into one. So you have to get the floating point distance from the original input vector to each of the corresponding uh, corner unit squares or whatever generalized n-dimensional space you have. This is where it becomes really subtle and it's important to think about what we're doing here. So what would happen if you, I mean, it's kind of explained in the slides, what would happen if you just like, instead of using a noise function, you just computed a random value for each point on your noise or on your mesh or your space, whatever you're, yeah, you get something like this. It would be disgusting. It wouldn't be useful to anyone. So what we're doing here is we're saying these four vectors are not only going to influence this point, but they're going to influence every point within this like generalized square space, and these two will influence everything in this one and so on, right? So like there's some continuous correspondence between points that are close to each other. They have the, they share the same points of influence. So we have these four vectors. Say these are R1, R2, R3, and R4. Those are your four random vectors. The next step is to get the vectors of the distances between this point and the corners of the unit squares. So you need this, 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 and this. Does everyone see those four vectors I just drew? Is that, okay, so let's say these are D1 through 4. So you have R1, 4, and D1. So now we have the distance vectors and the random vectors. And the final step here, which is kind of the integration, is to take the dot product of the distance vector with the dot product, well, with the randomly generated vectors. So you just comp like, you know, everyone knows what dot product is. You just multiply these three together. It's like getting the angle between them. And then that will give you like four values. Those will be not vectors, those will be single floating point values. So the final step here is to linearly interpolate between them. So we talked about what interpolation is in graphics and how that helps to explain what a LERP or a linear interpolation is in this context. is essentially like a way to average these four things based on how far away this point is from each of them into one value. So it's basically like you're, you're compounding, so r dot d, and then you get equals v, 1, 4, and then you just lerp from, say, 1 to 3, and then you lerp from 2 to 4, and then you could like combine these two values into 1. So as everybody, if a LERP takes, a linear interpolation takes a start and end, and like a, takes start, destination, and then the fraction of the distance that you are from the start to the destination, that's the inputs to the linear interpolation function, and what that will return is the like exact point, if you were at like say halfway from A to B, it would return the vector that is the value of that point on the line that connects them. That's what a linear interpolation is. So when you linear, linearly interpolate between one and three, you get a value back. Then from two and four, you get another value back. And then if you work between those two, you get one final float value that is your final height, or your final whatever you're generating noise for. So I think the most important thing to understand here is like what these four vectors mean and how they compound together. So was this, I don't know if you guys have implemented Perlin noise yet or if you wrote the code, but I hope this was giving you a little bit of insight into how it actually works. Does anybody have any questions about what I did? Was it super fast? Except for alert, you take in the start, the destination, the distance. Yeah, so, well, I guess. I need some more drawing space here. Okay. 
So a linear interpolation takes in a start and an end point, and then uh, say like an f value that is bounded between 0 and 1 that describes how far along this dotted line with 0 being a and 1 being b are you. So half, like if f was 0 0.5, you'd be right here, and that would be the value. That would be your alert position. Does that, does that make it a little more clear? Yeah, so the way you can do, I'm trying to think of what, how the best way to describe it given this model is. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. The best way I can think of is saying if you're lerping between R4 and R1, or say you're, you're yeah, you're lerping between the compounded R and D values for vertices as they're labeled here 1 and 4. You would take the, um, the fraction of the square that this original like point value is that way and then use that to get like that point because those share the same x value on that line, right? And then if you were doing it on a vertical axis, so between 4 and 3, you would take the y and flip that and then you can combine those together. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll just do another example point out here. So this is a, say your Perl and noise random space is 5 by 5. So you have um, 5 wide and 5 tall 2D array of pre-generated random vectors that have like, each one has a, like some random unit vector that points some arbitrary direction. So think about it in the space that you have a source space that you want to take, you want to find the value of the noise function for a point in your source plane. Say you're deforming a plane. So say you're taking a vertex, say your plane is 10 by 10 in size, and you want to take a vertex at position one, like on the, in units 1, 1. So if you're, it's your vert, and the thing is 10 by 10 wide, you just take the fraction of how much of this would be, and you would have like 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So that's how you get the value that describes. So basically what you're doing is taking the 1, 1, which is localized to the source space, converting it to a fraction that describes what it is relative to any space, and then resizing it to this graph, to this space. Does that, does that make sense? OK, so given a. Given a point that is defined in an input space of some size. So 1, 1 is defined as the point 1, 1, but it's relative to a size that's 10 by 10. So our goal is to describe not how big, not where the point 1, 1 is arbitrarily, but with respect to how big this space that it's described in is. So relative to the 10, 10, it's a tenth of the way right and a tenth of the way up. And so you know that if it's a tenth of the way up and a tenth of the way right in a source space, you can describe where it is in another space using those same fractions. Right, so if you had 0 0.1, 0 0.1, you would be somewhere away down here. So think about it, if you have a 5 by 5 grid, each one of these is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Right, and then 1, 1 would be like that. So it's important that you, your noise function Essentially, the way you control how fine-grained the noise is is how big your noise random gradient sample space is. So if this was like 100 by 100 instead of 5 by 5, you would have much more like fine-grained noise in your output results because there's more source vectors. Does that make sense? Any other questions on noise? I know this was a lot, and I, you can find the code for Perl and Noise like many places online. I want to reiterate that on the homework, like if you copy and paste Wikipedia code or any other code, I know it's on Wikipedia. Like, don't do that. Don't make me deal with that because it's going to be bad for both of us, and it's not fun. Just make sure you write it yourself. Um, hopefully, this kind of visual representation will make it easier to understand as you're writing.
Um, and yeah, that's about all I have on noise. And then somehow, through magic black box, you get something like this. Hopefully now you guys have a better understanding of what that black box is. So before we get to Trung's portion of the, the class today, I just want to clarify some points in the homework. Um, so if you make a noise function, right, that generates some kind of procedural terrain, per se, and you don't change the coloring of what the values are at different heights, it's going to be pretty hard to actually, for the user to see, like, what those height values are. If everything is blue, right, it's not going to, it doesn't show the depth very well, right? So something important to consider could be, um, maybe there's a way to change the color of each point on that terrain that's changed based on how high it is in the air. I'll leave that up to you guys to, to decide on how to do, but it's, it's like one line of code. Basically, all you have to think about is say, if this vertex is like 10, 10 units up in the air, maybe it gets more influence of this color, whereas if it's lower, it gets more influence of this color. It's like a, a word, same idea. Um, so that's one tip on the homework. Um, has anybody run into any like obstacles that they want to talk about with the whole class here that maybe we can share some insight on? Um, nothing? I'm going to assume you guys are all like 100% good if nobody has any questions. Okay. All right. So um, I'm happy this first project has been easier than expected. The next project will not be. Um, Trung, do you want to get started? Um, do you guys um, do you guys bring your laptop? Um, it's really easy to follow along. Oh, if you don't have your laptop, you can sit with someone. Yeah, I suggest you guys get into groups of two or three right now because you're going to be like coding together for the rest of the class. Um. Okay. Yeah. Um, I got you. You can fork it. Um, you want me to fork it? Yeah. Why? Okay, so if you guys go to the GitHub uh, for PanVR, um, there should be a repo for PanVR uh, HeadGazer. Uh, I'll show it on my screen while you're oh, talking. Oh, yeah. Do you... um, yeah, if you go to, yeah, it should be seen on top. Um, do you want to fork this repo? Yeah, so if you guys ever get lost and don't have this GitHub link, go to the course website. It's right there. And then... Good. No. Are you guys good, or do you guys need more time? Um, okay. Yeah. Good luck. Um, yeah. After you fork it, um, yeah, you, and you also need to clone it onto your local. I mean, that's the pretty standard. So while everybody's still cl uh, forking and cloning locally, um, just I wanted to clarify. Someone asked a question about the grading on the homework that I wanted to kind of talk about. If you do the bare minimum that's described in the PDF or whatever the Google Doc is called, <coughs> where it says if you make fireworks and make procedural terrain. And then that's it, that's all you do. That's good enough for like a 90 A minus grade because if you think about it, as I talked about earlier, if you don't vary the color or anything, the user's never gonna be able to perceive what those differences that you did are. 
So the better you make it look, the better your grade will be. And if you really dazzle us, you're going to get a lot of extra credit, and you'll have good like demo reels slash portfolio work. So you know, please like do whatever you want, and then that's a little bit about how the grading works. Yes, one in on this. Yes, code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just go in the terminal and type code space dot. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we all have this. No, no, just code uh, dot. Yeah. No, no. Uh, Wait, what? Watch. That's, that's fine. That's, that's why I want. Open folder. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, okay, so the uh, stuff that I'm going through today is just walking through a little bit of 3JS in case people are still a little bit unfamiliar with 3, 3JS. Uh, and then I'll do um, a little bit of small exercise uh, doing using head gazing for selection. Um, so a lot of the time in VR, one of the very typical way to select an object is just to stare at something and then um, you that's how you pick up an object and move around. Um, in case you don't have a controller or anything like that, that's like an easy way to do object selection. Um, so if you guys open the directory, um, this is <clears throat> I put everything inside the index.html. This is not the best way <laughs> to structure your code, but for the simplicity uh, to walk through, I just put everything in index.html. Um, uh, okay, so the body script is from line 36 uh, all the way down. That's sort of, that's the main. Uh, body of the code that's running. So if you just open um, the... If you go to Visual Studio Code and right click the file, it's in copy path. To, yeah. Open... Copy path. Copy path. And then go to Chrome and paste it. Yeah. Okay, so you guys open the index.html. Uh, it just gives you um, a scene like that looks like this. Um, um, and you click to play. So right now you just click on this and then you can look around and stuff like that. Uh, this is a very basic simulation. You can't move around. The reason is I also want to simulate this situation when you actually have VR, you actually don't really move around. Um, so a really good practice before you uh, code for um, um, actual VR application, you can prototype. Um, so a lot of the stuff we're doing now is just gonna prototype for a simulated VR environment. Um, so right now you just be able to look around and stuff like that. And this is a very simple scene. Yeah, so it's always like, I think going off what Trung was saying, anything you can do to be able to test what you write without putting on the headset will make your life like way better. Because anytime you have to put on the headset, there's like a, a cost of the time it takes to do that and run and build and all that. Yeah, so it could take some time. Um, so I think this way is easier to prototype test out. So in this, my goal for this assignment is really just being able to look at something and pick it up and move it around. Um, it's, really, it's a really simple task. Um, so let's go through the index. I'm, I will explain really quick um, the framework that we have. Um, Can okay. Can read this on the projector or is it too small? It is, yeah, let me know should, if it's too small. Should we make it bigger? I'm, I'm making it's good. Uh, let me do the wrap. Uh, uh, wrap, yeah, there we go. Cool. Okay. Um, the first group, these are just global variable um, uh, for the program. Um, okay, so there is an object called um, what I'm doing right here. So this section right here, um, I'm just briefly explain what it is. Um, this section from line 46 to 87. This first section create the camera the simulate the camera to look around using the mouse pointer. Um, this is just a 3JS um, module that yeah, that's imported. If you look at the, that I just put from the script, if you look on the folder for JS, under control, there's something called pointer lock control.js. That, this is what typically used to simulate how the camera looks around for 3JS. Um, it's just a module you import in, and then this trigger that to work. Uh, for VR camera, um, 3JS has something else called the VR controls.js instead. Um, I don't have included here, but um, when you actually use a VR headset, that would be a different type of control you can use from 3JS. That would make it a lot easier to handle input and camera motion and stuff like that. 
So just to clarify real quick, like the, the fact that Trun was controlling the way the camera looks with his mouse is essentially trying to simulate where the user is looking with their head in VR. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's basically like a first person camera. Uh, it's really straightforward, nothing crazy. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's, this is what this horn code does. And then we initialize it and then we animate it. Um, animate is basically just uh, an infinite uh, loop that's just keep running. Um, so initialization, um, I start with setting up the camera. Um, this is a perspective camera with a field view of 75, taking the aspect ratio of the window width and height. Um, initializing the scene. Um, so this is a scene graph. Um, handles all the objects in 3JS. Is part, it should be a, ch a child of the scene object. Um, and so similarly, so I start with adding a light. So I use a hemisphere light, mostly just, so hemisphere light is a type of light that <clears throat> Kind of bright, like it changes color based on how um, how far away you you are from the horizon. Um, just just for simplicity, for to make the scene look clear, that's the type of light it is. Um, adding this light in, uh, set the position for the light, and you have to you know. So now this is included into the scene. Uh, the scene dot add, adding light as a child of the scene graph. Um, controls. Create the whole um, interaction for the camera control that we have. Um, add the controls into the scene also. Okay, this is the part we will do in a little bit. So I'll come back to this um, for the right casting. Um, geometry. So this create the floor that we see down here using a plan geometry. So 3JS, if you go to the documentation. Um, and you just search through geometry. Um, there are a lot of different types of geometry. It's a default. Um, um, so we're using plan. Oh, we're using plan geometry. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of other type that you can use from 3JS that default that it gives gives out. Um, making a material. Again, um, we, we kind of covered this before. Combine them into a mesh, um, and then add that mesh to the scene graph. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. yeah so, sure. I, I got yeah. Got okay. Um, if you guys have questions, just stop me midway. Oh, if you need to, me to slow down. Um, okay. The next part: create a. I already generate a bunch of random cubes. So this is using box geometry. Uh, 500 cubes, making a material, uh, and put it randomly in the world. Uh, and I keep a reference of the cubes here inside an, an, an array, cone cubes. Um, and this array is declared up on the top as a global array. Um, so that way we can use the cubes, we can reference it later. Because once you add the, the mesh into the scene, it's kind of hard to keep a reference for it. So this is an easy way to keep a reference if you want to manipulate that. Uh, mesh later on. Um, the render just basically doing the rasterization part, um, so we don't have to worry about this at all. But um, every web, web, every three JS uh, needs a renderer. Um, cool. That is that is initialization um, for uh, for our what we have. Are you guys have any any questions? Good. Okay, cool. Uh, anime is uh, infinite uh, rendering group. I think Sasha talked about the request animation frame, uh, which basically every frame, it calls this function itself again. So we just keep calling every frame, calling this function. And then nothing. we do nothing here except to render the scene right here. So, okay, so in order to start with, um, if we want to, okay, so this is my objective is, I want to be able to look at something and um, turn let's turn the color of the cube to red. Um, what do you suggest? It's like a good start. Like, what would be a general idea? So, looking at it is um, the middle. Yeah, the yeah. Let's say the middle. 
yeah, looking at it and selecting it. Yeah. So do we time how long the so we first find what you're looking at and like the vector from the camera start really looking at like whatever that the the cube is and then we time maybe like if you stare at it for two seconds. Then yeah, so you stare for two seconds and then you change the color. If it's, you still stay at the same object after two yeah. seconds or something like that, and you change the object. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, so let's do that. Um, now, uh, the first thing you need to do is, yes, you don't know where the center of the camera is. I mean, you can get, like, yeah, I can say it's right here. But um, um, it's easy to, with, with a mouse, you have like a mouse cursor. So I guess with a headset, you will have something like crosshair or you want something to indicate where you're looking at. That would be the most intuitive way. Um, so let's start with making a uh, crosshair. Um, and you guys feel free to follow along. Uh, so um, let's make a crosshair. And OK, so, so when you go to, OK, so um, I just go to the section that has the to do. Uh, and I will just do everything from there. Uh, so crosshair, um, um, let's make this a, um, so 3JS has a geometry type that is called ring uh, geometry that looks like this, uh, could be a good start. Uh, so we can make a new geometry, a new ring geometry. Um, and give it, so it takes in an, an inner radius and an outer radius. So just you get, like give it a pretty small radius. Um, and then this is like the resolution of how, how many uh, tessellation, like how, how fine, um, how much detail we want. So 32 I think is a good standard start. And then, oh, I typo, um, okay, so and then you also need a crosshair material because <clears throat> everything, every mesh needs a new, new material. So just give it a mesh basic material is good. Um, this is a standard 3JS material. Uh, give it color. So I'm gonna give it. Um, I'm gonna give it sort of red and greenish. So it takes in a hex value. Um, so RPG, so these two are R, these two are G, the green, so red, green, and so it's yellowish, and then there's no blue component. Um, and you can make it, um, since it's going to be right in front of us, um, it's good to make it a little bit transparent. Um, so you can give it a little bit of opacity. Um, and then, so this is, this, is a, this is a way to create a transparent material. So it gives it some sort of opacity. Uh, okay, so we have that. And now we have to use, oh, this is have to be called var. Um, and then crosshair um, mesh. Um, it wouldn't do the transparency at all. Yeah. It would just be it's just, yeah, it's just ignore that. Um, so that has to be Turn on. Yeah, opacity by itself, like it would just ignore that variable, I think. That's basically what it does. So you create a new mesh and give it the geometry um, crosshair and uh, crosshair material. Uh, and then, then we have what you want. Um, I'm just making it like this. Um, okay, so um, since we create crosshair, it's just it should show up somewhere. Um, what did I miss? Add to the scene. Yeah. Okay. So you need to add this to the scene. Um, the crosshair man. Is there a reason that you made crosshair variable? Uh, actually, no. Um, I can. Yeah. Sorry. I, let me. You can just make it a, a local. I. I was just because I put all the variable in front. So I was just thinking it's easier to do, but yeah, there's no reason. Um, so like if you want to access it, if you want to modify it later on, yeah. Then you yeah. have to like save it somewhere. Yeah, then you have to save it somewhere. And you save the mesh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then you you want to save it somewhere, but um, since we usually just create in 
file for get for the parser, so it doesn't matter. Um, so we don't really, um, well, it's actually really sm small right now. Um, well, so um, it's it's actually in the scene. I think it's actually really small right now. Like I can, like just for example, you guys don't have to change this, but if I make it like super big or something like that. Oh, I make it wrong radius. Um, also, but hold on, let me let me test to see if you can see it. Add it to the scene somewhere. Where are you? Uh, on top of it? Yeah, it just zero, zero. Uh, yeah, it says zero, zero, zero. So we can't see it see, see right now. So it's adding to the scene. Okay, so what's a better way to actually see it? Um, do we really want to just add to the scene as zero, zero, zero? No, we want to add it right in front of the camera. So like the new, new plane marker, so you call it. Yeah, what do you think? You were going the right direction. Follow your camera, right? So like, yeah. You add something on the cameras. Things I'm not sure. Uh, yes. So I think you just nailed it. Yeah. So you actually instead of adding to the scene, you actually need to add to the camera itself. So remember, it'll inherit um, all the camera's transformation. So anytime you move the camera, it'll move. Um. Yeah. So and also since you don't want it right being in front of the camera, you kind of want it to like. Push out a little bit. Um, yep. um, you guys will to see it now. Yeah. Real quick, just status check. Does everyone have this up and running on their computers now? And like, can you see the demos working? Yeah. If you guys behind, let me know. Yeah, we I'll can come slow help down. you for sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Is the Z always like? <coughs> I guess it's always uh, like you can yeah. use the X and Y as well. Yeah. So Y is always up for camera. Oops. Yeah. Uh, and Z is so for camera Z is pointed, yeah, point into you, positive point into you, <laughs> negative point out. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. So well, which which part are you at? So what we do here is um, we say that the crosshair give it. Uh, we offset the position of the crosshair in a negative direction. Um, in this local space, and then uh, since we care about the car set always to be in front of our camera, instead of adding the car set to the scene, we actually want to add the car set to the camera itself. And just, so that way, it's always relative. Wherever you move the camera, you always always see the move the car set. Um. Um, <coughs> also, just real quick, if you are having trouble with Git, I believe the 19x core, did they do the 19x <laughs> Git presentation already, Jason? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's been done? Okay. So if you're having trouble with Git or you don't remember or you never, like, no course ever properly covered what forking, cloning, merging, branching, all those things are, maybe we'll hold a recitation um, for a brief overview since we already missed the one and next one, unfortunately. But yeah, we'll figure that out. So if you want that, come talk to me after. Yeah. Um, you guys you guys all know good on the same page. Yeah. You have to refresh your Chrome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just yeah refresh the Chrome. Control R, yeah. And then um, to move, you, so <coughs> the reason I have this is so that the screen doesn't like take away the mouse input. So click to play. So now, and you can hit escape to like exit the um, mouse. So, so that like the mouse can be used for the regular screen. And then click to play would make the, um, the application itself consume on the mouse events. Um, um, okay, so now we have the cards here. So now we, and that's the fun part, is we need to pass an array from the camera into the scene and see which object that we intersect with. Um, so the array caster, uh, this one we need to make uh, global because we need to update it every frame. So. Let's make a variable called raycaster on the top. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you guys have a black screen also. It helps to right click and inspect also. Yeah, that means you made a system um, And then you can go to console. 
Uh, and then, so let's say if I make like a typo, like I'm called has crosshair uh, huge or something like that, and then it's, it's black screen, you can't see anything, you can right click inspect, go to uh, console, um, actually, I think, yeah, Re refresh, and it would kind of like highlight where you have the error, and then you can show it can show on the side. There's a reference not defined. If you have you, you your screen is black, you can always do that. Um, okay, so we make a variable called Raycaster that is global, and three three JS conveniently make, give us a class called just literally actually let's I just show you guys on documentation. If you go to 3JS documentation, there's a Raycaster um, object <coughs> that's designed for assisting with Raycasting. Uh, really useful for testing, for Raycasting and stuff. Uh, so let's just make a new 3.Raycaster. I think it's lowercase c, yeah. <coughs> Um, okay, um, so now we have a red caster, but it doesn't really do anything. Um, so, so this is this part of the way to get, you want to say something? Does everyone remember what a ray is? Oh yeah, <laughs> everyone remember what a ray is? Okay. What is the two property of a ray? Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. What's the other property? One of you said it correctly, but I heard both of you, so yes, it has an origin. It's an origin. Well, it has an origin. So what else does it have on self? Direction. Direction. Yeah. Direction. yeah. It has origin an origin direction. and direction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just remember that. It's just what it's a what's an object is. So okay. So the reason I have to do right caster here is every frame we need to cast a ray from the camera into the scene consistently to test for after intersection. So we do something called gate ca ray caster and the documentation conveniently show it. Hey, when we render, set from camera. <laughs> so every camera frame, you do that. So let's look at actually what set for camera does. Okay, I just do a session. Set for camera takes in a 2D coordinate of the mouse uh, in a normalized device coordinate. Um, Everyone remember what normalized device coordinates are? If you don't, it says it. Yeah, it just, it. yeah it just. As uh, uh, the first term when it goes from negative one to one, that's a normalized device coordinate space, uh, and it takes in the uh, the camera where the ray should be cast from. Now, since we don't really have a mouse, we only always just cast from the middle of the screen anyway. This is that's where our eyes gazing is gonna be. We don't really care about. We just give it a um, zero zero for the coordinate. So over here, set from camera, and um, so there's a 3JS, um, I'm just gonna call it um, uh, center, and three. It takes in a screen um, sort of normalized code, so it's a basic screen space. So it's a vector, um, a two D vector. That real, for the coordinate. Real quick, who can tell me why trying putting that inside of the animate function is not a good thing to do? Sorry, bud. Yeah, yeah. You're reallocating that every function call. You can leave it. Though. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, you should move it out. I'm for the laziness, and I want to put everything in the same area so you can all see where they come from. <laughs> um, but yes, you don't have to allocate the center. It's always zero, 0, so you can put it somewhere else. Um, and give it the camera. So our camera was declared globally initially. Um, so it's okay. You can just call it for function animate. Um, um, and it will just work. So we have a ray caster set from camera. So now every scene, the ray caster will constantly kind of cast rays out. And um, again, to go back, so to find an intersectional array. Now you can always do this manually from the camera position and looking for using a camera look at vector. But the ray caster also give us another useful thing is the intersect object function. Um, so it's basically it will return to you a list of objects um, to check whether there's an intersection with the ray or not. So who can 
theorize how you would do that if you didn't have a function to <coughs> test. If you had a ray and you want to see what it hits in your scene, what would you do? Okay, that's a good start. So <coughs> what would be the two steps here? You, you know where your objects are via their boundaries. But how do you test against a ray? Okay, so let's, what, what is array again? There's two words. Origin and direction, perfect. So that ray is technically extends for everywhere in a direction from that origin, right? Yeah. So how can we test if it hits one of the colliders or the bounding boxes that we talked about? So I'll give you a little hint. You can define that ray as a bunch of continuous points along the direction from an origin. So now you so assume that you have like a list of points like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to like relative infinity. So given those sets of points, what could you do? Perfect. If any of the points hit an object, and there's optimizations you can do to make sure you don't test everything. But you can iterate through every object in the scene and see if it hits the object. That's called, is it ray marching? Is it That's ray marching. Ray marching. Um, yeah. yeah, what's the way to describe ray marching? Um, the second thing is because, I mean, this is obvious, don't so you have a ray equation. You have a sphere equation, which is like x squared plus y squared equals c squared equals to like some radius. Right, something you can that's just, a sphere, right? Yeah, that's a sphere equation. You can solve the equation, find where the intersection is. Linear system. Yeah. Just plug in. Um, and it works for any kind of geometry. A box has an equation, a triangle has an equation, a sphere has an equation. So basically to just abstract that for you. Um, if you really want to learn how that works, like four sixty again, make you do that stuff by hand. You have to write uh, it harder. But we, 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 we will not uh, do it in this class. So we're just going to use the convenience method uh, <laughs> that is called intersect object. Um, and, and then just give it the children of the scene. So a scene has a uh, property that's called children, yeah. So convenient. It's a, I mean, it's a tree, right? So <laughs> any, any node will have children. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it returned a um, a, a bunch of intersection. Uh, well, it's trying to. It's JavaScript, so it's a bear. It, take, a bar. it returns you something. But <coughs> we don't know what type it is. Yeah, so it returns to you. Um, is let's say what does intersection? Oh well, this uh, in false, uh, intersection returns sorted by distance. Uh, closest first, uh, and then inter yeah, and then far away. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, don't worry about the recursive. So in uh, JavaScript, you don't pass anything. It just take it the default. Say no. default. Yeah. Say no. So yeah, it just say um, basically it just say you want to check the children of that. But since we only have cubes, there's no like children of cubes and stuff like that. It's fine. This make it like faster um, for computation. So only taking top level objects in the scene. Right? Yeah. Like that's the. Um, so let's look at what the intersection that was returns. Okay, so okay, so why do what I'm doing? I'm gonna print out so we can actually what the intersect um, what the intersection object would look like. Yeah. Oh, intersect not defined. Yeah, I oh, <laughs> strong spelling. The, again, the console helps. Can you go so, back to the console real quick? Also, yeah. uh, you guys will note that I have a. This little thing turned on, that's pause on breakpoint, which means anytime you run in Chrome and it hits an error, it will stop and highlight what it did wrong. Yeah. This is an extension? No. It's just an option. Yeah. It's a Chrome. It's yeah. really useful when Super you work useful. with... with uh, I recommend always run with the console on until you like know for yeah. sure everything is working. Um, this is super useful. When you see a black screen, this is the first thing you can go to and check what happens. So, refresh down, down. this should work. Um, I'm gonna move this down a little bit. Uh, oh, actually, why would I shouldn't move it down? Because I want to see the print the console log. Um, there you go. So there's a bunch of object that was returned. Um, this is every time I stare at something, it uh, return intersection. Um, oh. Uh, no, I think it's in the while loop as well. It's right now. It's looping like crazy. Okay. Sorry. Um, Spam the console control. Can we pause the... <laughs> Wait, did I... That doesn't pause it. No, no. Just pause the... this, this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we look at... It is an array type, but it only has one element, because since 
we look at only one thing, like it is really just returning one thing for this, whatever this instance is, it's array of one element. That element is an object, and that object has a distance. This is how far away the intersection is. This is the width face um, uh, of the mesh that intersect with. And face index, uh, you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, this point is like the point of intersection. Um, so this is the intersect at 6.7, 3.5, and negative 21.6 because I'm looking at the negative z direction. And that's in world space, by the way. Yeah, that's in world space. Uh, and this, and it give me an object. This is the mesh that has the geometry and the material that we created. So this would be the cube, this object inside. So what can we do? So we can, so let's say I just want to color um, whatever I'm looking at red. Um, so I can look through all the intersection. And then let's color it red. So, so we get the object from because you remember it's an array, and then you get the an uh, object out from that. So, because it's, it's a, it has a property called objects, really what you hit, and then it has a material, and then it has a color, and you can't do a sign unfortunately. I think to update properly for three js, you have to do a call something dot set and then give it a value. So let's say for red is uh, EE000. Yeah, okay. So what this should do is everything I look at should now be color red, every time I look at it. <coughs> oh, red, red <laughs> everywhere. Um, are you guys at this? Get is everyone following along? Like, is, it, or is what we're doing making sense? Yeah, so um, uh, you get a bunch of objects from calling intersect objects um, on all the scene children. Now you can obviously you can you, if you don't want only children, you can want a subset. You can pass any any number of objects you want in here, and you want just intersect objects. So let's say your game is some sort of like you only want to pick up weapons. So instead of passing in scene of object, you pass in like lists of weapons instead. For example, or you want to pick up a gun or something like that. Uh, and then you want to intersect object differently. Um, so yeah, what I do, I look through all the intersections. So if there's no intersection, it should return as length of zero. Um, but um, if there's some intersection, like every object in that, I just color it red. Um, now, I don't also don't really like the, I'm just gonna, for the sake of not, just for aesthetic reason, I don't really like how the floor is so red. So I have a global variable floor which I use to create the floor down here. I'm just gonna say if, so because it's the same object that we created before, I can say if the intersection i dot object is exactly the same thing as the floor, I can just skip this whole business. Uh, oh, you can, oh no. Yeah, I could. Um, sorry. Yeah, you can do, I mean, you guys programmers, so you know. You have a choice you want. The concept is uh, they are the same object. I can basically skip coloring the core. And I have some error. Uh, intersect of oh, typo. Intersection. Uh, so now I only need to color the cube. And I can, I don't have the blaring crazy on the floor. Oh. Yeah, good JavaScript design. stuff. Oh, it was someone someone wants to explain. Yeah, Devesh or Jason, you guys need to explain this. <laughs> Devesh, what is triple equal? Oh, uh, it's cryptic quality with the scores in the multiplayer part. Um, you always use the digits. <coughs> yeah, so triple equal will basically do yeah. It does not type do type is. conversion at all. It's like it's the exact object that is equals. Yeah. So if it's like um, if I just use equal equal sign and that happened to something that has a different address but had exactly all the same attributes and same properties and stuff like that, it will still evaluate to true. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it is like high conversion. It's yeah. really bizarre. It's JavaScript. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I recommend always use triple equals. Um, um, <laughs> so equals true is true? Yeah. 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 Anything's not zero. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, which part of the crosshair that you... Oh, the down? Like, uh, where? Um, the... Oh, yeah. I just, yeah. So, uh, remember when I said JavaScript is the Wild West? That's what I was talking about. <laughs> So the back of the, the camera, the uh, hair is like where the raycaster is pointing. The only reason is because they just like are both in the center. They're not like connected to each other. No. Okay. They could have been. We could have parented theoretically parented the raycaster to the object and then set its origin as that every frame. Mm -hmm. But it's no real need to. I think yeah. I think this is like what they recommend way of doing it. Um, also, why do you think the crosshair was not color red? Yeah, it's not part of the scene. So it's interesting. Camera is actually not a child of the scene. Uh, camera is like a special object. Um, we just created it, and then it's there. Uh, it's part of the renderer, but it's never added to the scene. So when the crosshair was part of camera, um, it's not affected by the scene.children because it was never passing. Note that um, you, can, you can actually add a camera to a scene if you want to have multiple cameras, and you can move them around and do stuff with them. Yeah. But in this case, we didn't. So. Um, so we have, we have 20 minutes left? Oh, 10, 10 minutes. So, okay. Um, so how do you think we would do, um, let's just say, um, if I want, if I see something instead of coloring, I want to move it. I want to move the object that so I'm like looking, I'm looking at. So like stare at something and then move it. Like, um, so let's say kind of like how you pick an object, you can um, move it. Where okay, so how do I explain it? Um, so this is the way you're looking at, I guess. Yeah. So you just kind of picking it up, so levitate like it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of like look at it, and like levitate it, <laughs> stuff like that. Summer. Well, we don't. I don't think we have time to drop it, do the drop off part. But let's say just let's talk about how you would go about doing it, something like that. Uh, yeah. Um, could you make a child of the camera? Yeah, you should make. You can make a child of the camera. It's probably the better solution. Um, so um, this is the tricky part. So okay, so let's say I want to make everything everything I'm looking at, but I guess we only do like one thing that we're looking at, right? We know we don't want to like pick up everything we're looking at. That would be kind of crazy. So I'm gonna make another global called var selected cube. So this is like the cube that we're gonna be selecting, and this this is. Um, this is not recommended coding style, but this uh, variable I'm gonna use to say that I am currently selecting. So do not make do not select a new cube when this is going on. So this is what's gonna happen is uh, if I have an intersection with something, um, a list of object. Uh, so now instead of coloring it, oh let's say just keep, let's just keep coloring here. Um, I'm gonna set selecting to true and selected q is equal to um, the intersection uh, i dot object okay and then I'm gonna do it this thing outside so I'm not doing drop I'm just doing doing pickup right now so this is just because we we kind of running out of time. But you can say if it's selecting, then uh, if it's not select, if we're not selecting, then we should find and select something, and then you know once we found something, then set selecting to true, and this folder would not run again. So you only select one thing at a time. Um, and since only we care with uh, first object, you can just simply say um, do it. I guess you can do it once or something. Note yeah. that the only reason that this uh, mutex based approach works is because this is single threaded. Like you can imagine, if there were two threads running through this code, you could hit a race condition and this would fail. So like the only reason this works is because there's one core running it at a time. It's important to know. If you okay. do this on a GPU, it would, would fail. So normally, when you add something directly to the camera, it would do camera dot add. Unfortunately, what it does, it would use a local. It would use the local like the object's um, position and then move it directly to where the camera is. Um, in the example of the crosshair, what we see was we had to like manually offset the crosshair. Um, 
But in our case, when we want to pick up something, we want that object to be in the same position in world space. It's just now that it's, it could be just um, parented to the camera, but it has to be maintained the same position. So 3JS again to the saving. Uh, so there's something called the scene. Oh, I, why can't I try it? Why is it doing? Oh, I have to unzoom it. Is that good? Can I, why can't I send, oh, there we go, send you to, um, okay, so there's a 3JS object class called send utilities, oh, send you to, sorry, um, it has something called attach, um, so, let me zoom in, so attach, uh, no, no bad, uh, attach, uh, attach the object to the parent without moving the object in the world space, exactly what we want. Um, so we're gonna do, so it takes in a child, the scene object, and the parent, which is a camera in our case. So we want to do um, three, um, three dot scene utils dot attach, and then we want to attach the child. So the child we want to attach is this selected cube. Um, the scene and the parent we want to attach to is the camera. Um, so now, whenever you look at a cube, it should attach that cube to the camera and then change the color also. So let's see if this runs. Oh boy. It's a big cube. Uh, okay, so, because uh, they're all random. So, okay, so I'm going to look at something. I'm going to look at this cube right here. It should attach it. Oh, okay. Now I can move the cube right to me. Um, now this is very unrealistic. I mean, obviously you want to add other kind of animation or stuff like that. But yeah. Isn't that like if you stare at like a stack of cubes, you just like the entire group of cubes? Yes. Like, yeah. So it's terrible. So you, <laughs> I mean, so instead of going through the entire length, you can just like I'm just doing one. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> this is terrible coding. I'm sorry. That's um, because this is, yeah, this is like not 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 best style. But you know, this this at least allow me to pick like one thing. Um, uh, well, I'm moving to the camera with the mouse, and then this thing is because parented to the camera, it moves relative to where the camera, how the camera transformation is. Yeah, it can. Uh, yeah, in the camera position could move. Yes, but in yeah. In VR, you can't really. In just VR, like, you kind of just walking around, and I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to simulate it because it's probably give the wrong impression how you prototype stuff. You can, you, um, where we could do another one later on about like teleportation and stuff. Yeah. Well, how would you do teleportation? Now would you guys know ray casting? So if you want to get from, if I want to go from where I'm standing to the door over there. Yeah, using um this method of eye gazing or something like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you can do the same thing, like the right cast into say object, but instead of getting object back, you should get like the point of intersection, and then update where your camera location is. So you have to have the intersection you have to intersect yeah. with something, right? Yeah. You, otherwise, there would be no depth value. Yeah. You just go on forever. So in that case, you only want to intersect. Uh, if you want to teleport, you really just want to intersect with the floor, right? Because you don't want to in, you want to teleport up to the cube because that would be weird. So in this case, you would change it to intersect objects to the floor. Um, now um, we have five minutes, so I'm just gonna go through this. I don't know how much time we have, but JavaScript has something well, it's called set time out. This is a JavaScript, it's not a uh, 3JS thing. So uh, basically, the the set time out event say after that number of seconds, uh, then invoke this function. Um, so if you, because a lot of the time you want people to, the users to actually confirm that you want, they want to select something. You don't want them to just accidentally look at something and then automatically select that, that thing. So you want them to like, hey, you stare at this thing for five seconds and then you can select it. So you can do something like, you can do a window uh, set timeout event, um, set timeout, oh, nice, auto complete. Uh, give a function, I'm just going to call a function called select queue uh, and give it like a three second timeout. Um, this, this is kind of rushed, so I don't think I can cover this whole thing. I'll give you the concept uh, right now. So basically, you do something in here. Um, okay, so what you do is 
you need to have two objects to check. One you're currently looking at um, um, at this frame, and one okay. So one at the beginning when the test set timeout is called, and one is every frame. And then it, after five seconds, those two objects are the same thing. Uh, then you you check that object is being selected and change the color, for example, or make it pick up. Um, so like in, uh, you know, so you will have something like select a cube, and you have something called like look at cube or something like that. This is a cube that every frame you're looking at, and this is the one that beginning, like the first time you stare at it, um, um, and then within that duration, it's after five seconds, they all did the same cube, then you confirm that user wants to select that. And then you can do stuff inside select cube. So um, I don't know, we, we probably don't have enough time to go through the whole logic. Yeah, so it could be a rush. Um, so this could be, so now you guys get to this part, uh, could be a fun assignment that you, so yeah, use windows.setTimeout um, to do an interval checking um, like that, so that you don't select the cube right away, but only select it after user has stayed there for, for a while. Um, uh, same thing with drop off. So there's a lot of way you can do drop off. Um, if you don't have a controller, in a lot of cases when you have a, like you only have a headset, drop off could be done by, if the objects now move to an area that's okay to drop off, just automatically detach the object. So you can have another, imagine you can have a, um, like, a like a drop off uh, area, like a drop off sphere or cylinder or something like that. It's like basically an area that if the cube is now in that area, just drop it off. So that's that's like easy to way, the way to do. There's not a whole lot of other ways to do drop off unless if you if you don't have a controller. So it's just eye looking. It's kind of hard to do a lot of drop off. You can do it with motion shake, shaking, like make sure someone shakes a whole lot. It drop off. But I think that's bad because you don't want someone to shake their head crazy to do drop off. So people use tricks for drop off. Um, just like only draw a specific area or something like that. Also, if you take, you guys will notice that the more and more you play with the headset on, if someone <laughs> else is like sitting next to you and watching you just like with the headset on, you'll look like a goofball. So mm -hmm. if you're working in teams, it's oftentimes funny to like let the person no. shake their head and then get it on video. No. Like, <laughs> you can try to do the shake up, yeah, <laughs> mechanics. Uh, I don't really recommend it um, a whole lot, <laughs> but try it for fun. Um, but yeah. Uh, just want to re reiterate again, uh, the reason I don't want to do motion in here is very ter very bad if you take away the camera control when someone is in VR. So if you can mimic not having to move camera as much as possible, you can still implement moving around with WASD like a regular first person shooter in this. Um, it just, the, the prototype would not be as an accurate experience as if you, uh, you want to translate it directly to in the VR case. Yeah, you can check the Q intersection with the floor. So, and then at the moment, hit that and it just stop. There's yeah. some 3JS collision events, I believe, that you can use for that. But yeah. Five second delay, though. Right? So, so that's when you need to add a five second delay. Yeah, before you can actually select something. Okay, so we're we're out of time. Um, if there's any quite last minute questions on Chung's demo, now's the time. Um, before everyone leaves, I want to leave it as an intellectual exercise to <coughs> think about how you would implement the attach function on your own, given the world space of the camera and the world space of the object. So feel free to brainstorm on that. But yeah. Visual Studio Code. Oh, Visual not Studio not code. full Visual Studio. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's amazing. Um, yeah. If you use uh, <laughs> if you use npm to install 3JS instead of putting the like CDN link into your HTML, it'll actually debug your code and show you errors for you. So that's cool. What? I just used Sublime. Well, yeah. Sublime is totally fine. Sublime is totally fine. Sublime is totally fine.